Good evening and welcome to this evening, um, our celebration of Refugee Week and our work in our first year as a University College of Sanctuary. My name is Helen Mountfield, I'm the Principal of Mansfield College and uh, we have tonight, this evening a discussion about the experience of refugees and also the work that is taking place and can be done um, in institutional and human terms to support refugees and those who are seeking asylum or sanctuary. So we're delighted this evening to have with us two individuals, both of whom happen to be bishops of the Lutheran Church, uh, which has a strong historical link with Mansfield College, and both from very different parts of the world. Um, my first guest this evening is Bishop um, Dr. Munib Yunan, who is joining us from his home um, in Jerusalem. So welcome this evening, Bishop Munib. Um, Bishop Munib is the former president of the Lutheran World Federation, which is a global communion of Christian churches that has 145 member churches in 79 countries and represents more than 70 million Christians across the globe. The Lutheran World Federation, in cooperation with the Council of Lutheran Churches, has had links um, with Mansfield College from the mid-1950s until the late 1990s, um, during which period they sponsored a Lutheran tutorship at the college and we're delighted that our chaplain at Mansfield now is a Lutheran. Um, in his capacity um, as president of the Lutheran World Federation, Bishop Munib signed with Pope Francis I the historical reconciliation between the Catholic and Lutheran churches. And he also initiated with the um, UN Commissioner um, for Refugees, the document on welcoming a stranger, affirmations for faith leaders. And that's a document that was signed in the General Assembly of, uh, of Religions for Peace in Vienna in 2013 by all the religious leaders who attended that meeting. And Bishop Munib still provides leadership for the ecumenical patriarchs and heads of local Christian churches in Jerusalem, um, as well as the Council of Religious Institutions in the Holy Land and Interfaith Organization, of which he's the co-founder. Bishop Moon is recognised as a leader of interfaith dialogue and an advocate for dialogue, peace and gender justice issues in Palestine and Israel, which is obviously a very difficult job at the moment. Um, and Bishop Moon was granted the 34th Nuano uh, Peace Prize in 2017 for his very extensive work in interfaith dialogue. And he's the Honorary President for Religions for Peace International. And Bishop Moon will be speaking this evening and sharing with us his own experience as a Palestinian refugee and also his work encouraging communities and leaders around the world to, um, to support and embrace those who are seeking sanctuary. Um, our other speaker this evening, our other guest, is Bishop Tor Jürgensen, who is joining us from his home in Norway, or his son's home in Norway. His home is north of, just north of Oslo. Um, I don't know where his son's home is, but it is also in Norway, and that's where he is, with an appropriate backdrop. Welcome, um, Bishop Tor. And Bishop Tor is the Bishop of the Lutheran Church in Great Britain, and Chair of the Council of Lutheran Churches. And he and the Council of Lutheran Churches have very generally, generously sponsored um, the Sanctuary Scholarship at Mansfield College, which has been, a, a cornerstone of our um, development as a College of Sanctuary um, and reflects the historic work um, of the Council of Lutheran Churches in the United Kingdom. Um, that organisation was originally founded to support Lutheran refugees, especially from Eastern Europe, who had been displaced by the Second World War. And we are really happy to have re-established our link uh, with the Council of Lutheran Churches. I was honoured to meet Bishop Tor here um, before well, in the before times, I can't remember, it's been the before times, before, before, before COVID stopped anyone meeting anyone except over a little screen. Um, but it was a pleasure. And Bishop Tor was previously um, the Bishop of Sir um, Hulugland in, in the Church of Norway, um, where he was and continues to be active in social justice issues. Um, and because he has also served as a Lutheran priest in Japan for 15 years, he has his own experience of being in someone else's land as a stranger. Um, but after that, he became the Secretary General of the Norwegian Mission Society and travelled to communities all around the world. And so he brings with that experience an international perspective. And he, today he will share his experiences of standing in solidarity with those who are seeking sanctuary um, in what I have no doubt will be a th thought provoking and inspiring conversation. So if I could turn first to you, um, Bishop Munib, and if you could begin by explaining some of, or, and sharing with us some of your own experiences as a refugee. Thank you very much, uh, Helen. 
first of all, I would like to thank Mansfield uh, College for uh, honoring me uh, in this, you know, talk this evening. Uh, and at the same time, you know, I greet you from Jerusalem that needs your prayers for justice at the moment. Um, you know, I myself am a refugee from Beersheba in the south. My two parents are refugees. When I met Colin Powell, State Secretary of the United States of America, I told him that I'm a Palestinian refugee. And I told him, had the church, the Lutheran church, not embraced me in the 50s, I don't know if I would have become a pastor or a bishop, or I would have lived in a refugee camp and I don't know what have become out of, of me. And that's a very important thing to understand, you know, that the Lutheran church has embraced me, has educated me, has helped me to stand on my feet and work for justice and peace and interfaith dialogue. So empowering the refugee to stand on their feet is a very important task for us. And it's a very holy task that Christ calls us to do it. Not only to give them, you know, um, food for that moment. You know, I myself have still have the UNRWA, United Nation Refugee Welfare Association card. I still hold it, but I don't use it because the church embraced me and I am what I am today. But I keep it to, I keep it this card and I renew it always in order to keep my right as a refugee. And that's very important for us to understand. So educating, empowering refugee is our call. However, today we are finding that the refugees are increasing in our world and not decreasing. And we are noticing a negative approach either from Europe or from the United States towards, you know, some countries do not want, some countries have closed the borders, some countries do not allow them to cross, you know, the, uh, the, the refugees to cross uh, the Mediterranean and be with them. And, you know, you know, all these stories. I myself have written two letters and sent them public statements. One in 2015, when the refugee uh, wave started to increase, and then European Union started to discuss about, you know, the refugees. I wrote first of all for the world leaders and especially for the European leaders, you know, to, um, um, to, remember, to remind them that the position that is taken, only two countries accepted the refugees at that time, Germany and Sweden, while the others, you know, they started to argue about the numbers. I say, it's a shame because that the international community is ignoring, you know, the, is ignoring the issue of refugees. It must be remembered that refugees, refugees are not vacationers nor tourists. They don't leave their homes because they were looking for adventure. They are displaced as a result of poverty, violence, terror, and political conflict. Frustration and fear lead them to risk their lives and their life saving in search of safe havens where they can live and raise families in peace. We must remember that even the media was using waves, masses, or hordes. Refugees are not hordes. They are human beings who deserve dignity and respect. All political leaders in Europe and in the United States, in the Western countries, are responsible for this current refugee crisis, either directly or indirectly. This is the result of a global system, not merely, of a, not merely a local crisis. The international community has not helped to solve the conflicts in the Middle East and North Africa, including the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Economic and political interests have taken priority over peacemaking and dialogue. Our region 
has become so chaotic that it opens the doors to extremists and terrorists. Our people are becoming desperate. The Middle East needs justice and peace, not only to end the flow of refugees, but so the displaced people can return to their homes in dignity and live in their free democratic states and build it in their own hands. I've written also another letter just to, know, to, to, uh, to Mr. Trump when he used to be the president of the United States, when he only allowed seven, he, he, he denied seven Muslim countries, you see, he denied them to enter to the United States. And I've written a letter to tell him first of all, that I am worried. Of course, he never answered me, but that's fine with me, you know, but I'm really, I have raised my voice here because this attitude has created Islamophobia. When you deny, as if you are saying the refugees are only Muslims. And this Islamophobia is dangerous. And for me as an, a Palestine, an Arab Palestinian Christian, when you are denying some Muslim countries, this shows that you give Christians preferential option and you punish the Muslims. And this Islamophobia is not accepted. I am worried, I told him. And I told him, I am worried because Jesus was received as a refugee in Egypt. And he was, they took care of him in Egypt until, you know, Herod died and then he returned back. And for me, I told him also that our, our Lord demands from us to accept the refugee when we welcome the stranger into our homes and our hearts, we welcome Jesus. Thank you. Uh, yeah. And Bishop, Bishop Tour, um, I wonder if you could start us off um, in the same way, just talking a little bit about your um, work with uh, refugees and in, in Norway and um, the Sanctuary Scholarship. Yeah, when it comes to the last thing, with the scholarship, I'm very happy that uh, the uh, Council of Lutheran Churches were able to put to get in touch with you and able also finding the funding for for this scholarship uh, it started out as an idea for the church and we had contacted lwf uh, to see whether there were money available for a scholarship like this but unfortunately they had to say to us that according to the rules for those kind of scholarships or, or funding or grants uh, this is not inside it because it's not directly connected with one of the churches so therefore, the, the, the council found that they would then support it. So I'm so happy for that. And the old connection with Mansfield College, I've, as you mentioned, also been able to visit there. We had the intention of having a bigger uh, Lutheran uh, leadership conference uh, in Mansfield College last year, but due to the corona restrictions, we could not do that, but we come back again maybe uh, in a year or two uh, for a new conference with you, so at your place. So I'm so happy that we have been able to do that uh, and then connecting with the old tradition of uh, relationship between Mansfield College and the Lutheran uh, presence, the Lutheran churches. Uh, yeah situated in, in the, the UK. Uh, the council itself was a fruit, as you mentioned, of the refugee situation after the World War II, uh, where a lot of those displaced people from, especially the Eastern Europe, European uh, Lutheran churches had sought a refugee, uh, refuge in the UK and then how to handle that afterwards. So, so the whole setup here is, is basically a question of, of how to solve the refugee challenges and different difficulties. So therefore, there's a big link, a long link here, and I'm very happy with that. My personal history is nothing like uh, Bishop Nape, so it's so strong to hear your, your speech, uh, Bishop, about your own experiences and all the difficulties you are facing at your place now. Uh, I myself, as you mentioned, Helen, uh, I've been uh, a stranger in a foreign country myself for 15 years. I served in Japan uh, 
And uh, we were met very friendly and openly and no problem at all in one way. But I have learned a lot about the details concerning being a foreigner coming to a, a country which is not your own. And that is really a challenge, uh, even if all the well-willing people are around you and hoping to help you. In my driver license in Norway, I was not uh, obliged to use spectacles, but according to the Japanese license I got, uh, they mentioned that I need to have those on, and I was stopped once because I didn't stop where I should stop. And, and therefore they asked me, but the, the problem became, why didn't I have my spectacles? And I had to argue for, for an hour before a good policeman could say to me, okay, you can only borrow your uh, wife's spectacles, isn't that enough? And I laughed at that at that time. I thought it was stupid. But afterwards, I really considered that was a sort of well-willing attitude towards me to solve the problem for me and in one way also for him as a host for, for me in Japan. And if refugees could have met something of that attitude, but they are met with distrust and they are met with all if there are anything which can be difficult, then those are pursued and making it impossible or at least very difficult for them to, to be staying in a country. Mm. I myself, when I came as Bishop Sir Hulugalam, which is difficult to pronounce, but uh, <laughs> up in the north, just under the Polar Circle, when I was Bishop there, there was a Romani people. Do you say that in English? Yes. Romani? Romani. Yes. And they could not get up their tents and camp and uh, live. And uh, even the mayor of the city then said to them they had to leave. And then I opened the garden to the bishop's residence and they could uh, use my garden for a month or something. And, and that was a big, big th media thing uh, because uh, the distrust was all around there. But we were fortunate. We had people helping us to interpret a simple thing, but then that could create a sort of understanding of the situation and be to help for, for them. And when I retired, I became the chairperson of a small little organization called uh, People in Limbo in uh, Oslo. And uh, we have tried then to put an uh, emphasis on what shall we do with those who have been in Norway without uh, the right to be there according to Norwegian standards, but nowhere else to go. And, and uh, they have been there for from five to, to 30 years. And uh, the Norwegian government looks like they don't uh, care for them at all. They don't see them. They are non-existent. And, and I've tried to help them and work for them. But the days now since 2015, as you mentioned, Manil, is very difficult. The whole political atmosphere, the ethical, moral kind of compass has left us. Uh, so it is really a big challenge. Being a bishop in a uh, Great Britain church, it is not uh, appropriate to have a foreigner as, as, as a bishop. And I've not been able to visit my diocese uh, for one and a half year now. So that is very bad. And I know very little about what is actually going on in the, the political discussion in the UK. But certainly also after Brexit, the question of receiving refugees, being open to foreigners, to those who are strange strangers, is as important as it ever has been for us. And how shall we solve that? And to put that challenge, not only to the churches, but also to the society we are living in, I think is important. And therefore this meeting, uh, you have uh, this week, refugee week you have in uh, Man uh, or arranging in Mansfield is of great importance also for us. So thank you for inviting me and for being able to also to be here together with Muni. We have met each other many times before and last, the biggest event for me was visiting his country in 2013. And we were traveling together for a week or so, all the bishops uh, from the Council of Bishops in, in Norway together with Muni and his friends in, uh, in his country. Yeah. And uh, we were treated as good, uh, VIPs giving, give, given special treatment when we should cross the border from Jordan into Palestine. But uh, Monib, he had to go through a, 
we were an hour or something of screening before he could rejoin us after. So that was a good, a bad, very bad example of how they can treat people. Mm. Do you have any other examples, either of you, about the way the Lutheran World Federation does work with refugees as part of a diaconical approach, really, and embracing refugees? Well, I think, you know, the LWF, since in its inception in 1947, had in its mind to care for every refugee in the world. And I would like to say that in 1993, uh, the the LWF has also had a document called Diaconia in Context. And it speaks about prophetic diaconia, which means how can we help the dignity of the human being who is a place or immigrant, you know? And for this reason, the LWF, I can give two examples. Uh, we are caring, for example, for uh, the LWF on behalf of the UN United Nations is managing Dadaab refugee camp in Kenya, which is the largest uh, refugee camp in the world that has half a million refugees from Somalia, and uh, and it it. It, uh, the, uh, the UN, until today, they trust what we are doing because we do it in a professional way and we allow them to retain their dignity, especially for women and for the youth, in order that they can. And that's very important example to give how the church is working today. This is, diac this is prophetic diaconia. The second thing is what uh, is very important, what LWF has done is also in Zaatari camp in Jordan, from the Syrian refugees who came to, to, to that refugee camp, we started work. Now, you know, it's not for granted when the Lutheran Federation, which is a, a globally, you know, a recognized organization, is working in, in, in refugees. For example, in Jordan, some people were criticizing us, you know, uh, that uh, why are we helping uh, the Syrian refugees? Some of them belong to the opposition. We told them, well, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. We don't care what is the, what is the race, what is political or religious or affiliation or gender. I mean, we care there are people in distress. They need protection. They need, you know, and, and we have helped even them in Jordan, you know, to um, in 75 schools to renovate it in all that we can, we can really do this work. So we emphasize on winterization and on education for in, in, now what I would like to say I'm really very grateful for all our Lutheran churches in the world, you know, that whenever we approach them on helping the refugees, they are ready to open their pockets and their treasury and to give what is. I remember once in Congo, when we spoke about refugees, they collected a poor country. You know, the amount is not important. The amount was up to $100 only, but the idea behind it, to help a review, LWF to do its work, for them it is one year salary for a person, but for, for us, $100 is very small amount, but at the same time, you could see that the Lutheran churches are interested in prophetic diaconia in the world, in order that the human being will retain their dignity and work for justice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, how how is that done? How is the embracing done in practical terms? I mean, you, you talked about the refugee camp that you run in, in, in Kenya for Somali refugees. Um, but is that uh, a purely Lutheran World Federation initiative or is this partly interfaith work? Well, of course, it's also interfaith work. I mean, it's very, this is a very important question. Even as committed by Christ to serve, 
our role is not to convert them to Christianity. Our work is also to work with religious leaders, their Muslim leaders, with their imams, with their, uh, uh, with their religious leaders, in order that we can empower them. We want them also to be religious, you know, and we want to help them to be religious, but we are not converting them. To, and we tell them, we don't want you to become Lutherans or Christians. We want to be what you are. It's our call to help you as a human being, because you are created in my image, in the image of God as I am created. Yeah. So that's that's the, the, how, how can we, we, we carry that, you see? That's very important to under, this is a very important question. Some think we want to make diakonia in order to convert. No, that's not our role. And that's not our weakness, by the way. Some missionaries won't like it. They would say, we are not doing Christ. No, I am doing Christ's work when I am helping my neighbor who is in distress. That is in itself a Christian mission. Yeah. Um, and, and how, um, Bishop Tor, does that idea of welcoming the stranger come about? How, how can you teach people to welcome? They often frighten to, or there's, or there's government policy in this country. Um, there was a, an overtly hostile environment for migrants. That was the policy. We will be hostile. So how do yeah. we turn around people to want to be welcoming and how do they do it? Yeah, there are two, two levels to this, I think. One is on a more personal, local level. And I'm almost shocked in my own country, Norway, how few of the new members of the Norwegian society, even those who have been accepted as refugees and got asylum in Norway, how difficult it seems to be to be a good neighbor to those, inviting them to their homes and having social contact and help them with language and cultural uh, matters and so on. Uh, and we felt the same when we were in Japan, before we were able to speak Japanese. It was very difficult to communicate with the, with the Japanese around, around us. So language, being in contact, creating an atmosphere of um, goodwill, I think is, is one basic thing we can do as Christian and as Christian communities in local congregations and so on. And we need to train for that and we need to stress the uh, consciousness around that. And then the second level is, of course, the, the, the political level here, because the European countries have been closing the borders, so there is no place for new ones. And uh, that should have given us a chance at least to make everything in order for those who are here, without papers necessarily, but give them a sort of special refugee status then to be able to live with us because they cannot be returned. But for those borders closed, the attitude seems to me that we as Christians have to speak to that and, and support all political ideas of being more willing to, to work together with UNHCR, the, the High Commissioner of, of Refugees, and, and find ways to, be, to get those people in safe heaven, heavens, heavens with those who are in really dire straits and who are also accepted by the UNHCR. Mm -hmm. So these are big, big issues. And I feel somehow this is one of the biggest ethical challenges we have faced for decades. And uh, it can only be compared to the uh, climate change problems, the way we are solving this and our moral stance that uh, we uh, evaluated accordingly, I think. So therefore it is so positive that you in Mansfield also have, have had this uh, sanctuary scholarship idea and wanting to focus on this. Yeah. And Bishop Munib, do you have any ideas on how we can encourage people to feel welcoming? You, you talked about the rise of Islamophobia, how that's been encouraged by some of our leaders, some quite extreme like Donald Trump, but others not so extreme, who nonetheless think that you encourage people to have a hostile environment to those outside and to conflate people who come because they have to and what are seen as adventure seekers or benefit tourists or whatever words are used to describe people who come here. Thank you. I think this is an important, you know, um, you know, a question which, which uh, you, you are mentioning. 
the first point is we have to change our mindset. Mm. And to change our mindset is not to think that um, to get out of our self, or let me put it in this way, if you wish so, from our selfishness and self-centered. That it's not only the Europeans who have to live in dignity, but others also have to live in this in this dignity. And there are others who are as good, you know, uh, um, as good uh, 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 f believers in God, you see, as we are. And this changing the mindset to accept that others are still living in poverty, you know, is, is very important. It puts us really to think about, you know, God and about ourselves. I want to tell you that it's a shame when today we read the, when the report of UNICEF gives us that child labor in, in the poor country has grown and the world is quiet. This is the latest, which last week, the word is quiet. And as if, you know, okay, we accept it. Why? Why I think we, we accept, you know, I want to tell you another point, which is very important, that when we worked on what you mentioned, this uh, welcoming the strange affirmation of faith leaders, it was the UN, you know, uh, um, UNCHR that time, um, who is at the moment, uh, the Secretary General of the UN, who invited us and you know we have together to find an interfaith dialogue the common values for faith and protection yes, and yes. all our faiths you know have something to speak for example you know the hindus say the guest is as god the torah we are the torah always we miss there are these 36 references for honoring the stranger. The Christian tradition is strong in Matthew 25, in, in, in various places how we care to care. Uh, Christ asked us, you know, uh, uh, did you visit, did you do this? I said, and he asked us to care for the prisoner, for the stranger, for the refugee. In Islam even, they say, I have quoted this from Surat Al-Anfal, in, in the Quran, those who give asylum and aid are in very truth the believers. For them is the forgiveness of sins and the provision of most generous. I mean, this is the Quran. It's not me. We we always think that Islam is only, you know, speaking about violence and speaking about the, but we don't know the philanthropic and diaconical approach also of other religions, not only of our, and we, we have to unite together with other religions to serve humanity. For me, this is what is very important because all of us have values for that. And it was very important to write a code of conduct, you know, that we leaders in the world could sign it in order, in order to oblige us to work for that. Not yes. only to speak, not only to preach, but to accept the other. And it's very important for us, you know. Again, I, I, I say it, when I look to another person, I must see God in that person, not only myself. Mm. In the refugee, in the displaced, in the immigrant, in, in those who are different than us. And that's a difficulty, and especially when we speak today about Islam, we are saying to them as if, you know, no, I think, you know, many times I've said, sometimes I prefer that my neighbor is, is, is a Muslim, not a Christian. You know yeah, why? Yeah. They are good neighbors. Hmm. It's missed. Yeah. They, they, they don't like, they like to live in dignity, in hospitality, in generosity. It's, and that's, that's missed in the world. We look to them only from one point because one leader said this or that. Yeah. No, that endangers our lives if we don't accept Islam as human, as Muslims as equal human beings as us. Yeah. In this case, we change our mindset. And in this case, we can really stop this Islamophobic by our leaders and others who are promoting it. 
Yes. So we, I mean, perhaps that's one of the things that's happened in, well, either principally Christian or, or, or faithless societies in Western Europe, that people have conflated the idea of radical Islamism with Islam in general, and then other, what they see as principally Muslim refugees and, and and, and don't try to identify the common ground they have or the common values there are in different faiths and in lots of other social mm -hmm. ideas and movements. No, I agree. I agree. Yes. 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 You know, I agree. One thousand. I, uh, as a Palestinian, Arab Palestinian Christian, I lived 1,400 years with Islam. Mm -hmm. And I'm always saying, we are ready to come to Europe and the United States and to Canada to teach you how to live with Muslims. Yes. Okay. Well, I'm going to I'm going to ask other people if they have um, questions, and I think Sarah Farrow, Reverend Sarah Farrow, our Lutheran chaplain, might um, uh, manage some of those questions. But I was going to ask you before um, that um, what challenges there are for European communities to address the needs of refugees and those seeking sanctuary. What ought we to be doing? I feel myself that it's unfortunate that I already have become 75 years old, so my so many years I have left to work for this, I don't know, but but it's like I would have liked to, to start now and challenge also the youth here to, to look at this future. We cannot continue like it is now when we are closing our borders and we are meeting people with distrust and... Uh, uh, neglectance so therefore this is a, one of the biggest as i said one of the biggest challenges moral challenges we have as european societies and how shall we be able to improve contact 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 to be in touch with people knowing them and then also being building bridges uh, religious bridges it is so strange and so depressing to see how many Christians are negative towards Islam and Muslims without knowing anything about it and without knowing no uh, Muslims in their neighborhood even. So the contact is the basic here on the local level. And by the experiences we are making, like also Bishop Menib is mentioning, we can also provide the politicians with the visions of a new reality that we are neighbors to each other all over the world. We are global citizens, so to speak. And that's a good biblical idea, isn't it? And we will listen to the story of the Good Samaritan afterwards in this evening, uh, the beautiful uh, speech by, by Jesus himself, showing that one who was an outsider became the hero of the story. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a good thing for us to remember. Yes. May I, may I add some on what my brother, you know, Tour has said, you know, um, um, showing them hospitality, educating them, empower, that's important. But at the same time, if we want to uproot the issue of refugees, that they don't disturb you anymore in Europe, your governments must work for justice and combat poverty in the world. Justice in the Middle East, starting from Jerusalem, not to be complicit, not to be one-sided. Jerusalem needs justice. Make, make peace in Jerusalem, and we'll find peace will reflect in all world. And allow those countries, you know, don't look only to your narrow national interests. Look to the justice for these people in Syria, in Iraq, in Lebanon, and so on. Because I'm afraid also for the Christian presence in these countries, if there is no justice in it. I'm afraid for Africa and many parts of Asia and Latin America, if this neo-colonialist is coming and we don't allow their, these nations to stand on their feet. You have to remember that we are interdependent. It's no more we are independent. No country is independent. We are interdependent. What happens in Africa affects me in Jerusalem, affects people in Houston, affects you in Mansfield or where, wherever we are. This interdependency will help us to work for justice. Your politicians must work only for justice for those people who are oppressed because God hears the cry of the oppressed. Mm. Um, please, I mean, 
I'm going to hand over to Sarah and I see a couple of questions in the chat, but I, just before you get there, I mean, you, you talk about this need for justice, but the mindset in Europe is often that refugees are taking away from us. There isn't enough. We don't have enough. And there's fear and distrust. We have, you know, we have need in our midst already um, and we don't recognise the contribution that refugees are making. Do either of you have ideas for how we can break through that mindset and encourage people to see the, the human and the stranger and, and, and welcome people into our midst? Yeah, I, I have two ideas. That's a challenge for the teachers too, to meet directly people they are talking about, not only talking about them as items and cases, but meeting people is of great, great importance. And, and the, the second uh, point here is, is also that in Norway, at least, we are have a sort of uh, budget for foreigners, and it is very negative. We are using so much money on those who come, but they don't. They forget what the contribution is of the children of ref earlier ge refugees, for instance. So, if you put a one generation, two generations to this, it has been an asset for Norway to have got new young people and new generations to come and be together with us. And they have accumulated a lot of positive things in our society. And I think the UK is more used to having that like this in their own country, but still, we need that mindset of being together and looking on a bigger perspective and challenge the politicians to, to, to have that perspective too, both the local direct contact and the bigger perspective of the, the bigger development. Uh, well, I, I have also two points, trade. like two so, here. Mm -hmm. One point is uh, very important. I think, you know, I appreciated uh, Mrs. Merkel the chancellor of uh, Germany, who once said, you see, and she is the daughter of a Lutheran pastor as well, you see, and she understands, you know, very well what is the meaning of refugees. She, she said, the refugees who are coming to our country are a good working force and we can work together. They are not a burden. They are, they work with us and that's, important for us to see. Secondly, I know that in, in Europe, you know, you like to separate religion and state and they say nothing. But I would say, you know, when I look to many churches, not only Lutheran in Europe, how much they are working for refugees, for justice issues, for issues of combating uh, poverty, for environment, just name it, you see, for gender justice and other things, you know. I think the governments have to learn from the churches and ask the churches to give them a hand and advice how to work with these issues and not to take as a church only they have to be in their own you know, sanctuaries. The churches in Europe must be proactive on issues of justice and not tell them you, have not to, you are interfering in politics. It's very important that the churches are asked and, and they are given the chance to, they give them the opportunity to advise the government on what to do, especially on international aid. You know, if I speak about international aid, I have my own disappointments always. Always they tell us, we, you know, international aid, we, don't, we know we don't want fraud, we don't want, you know, laundry. I mean, we want everything to be transparent. That's our, you know, and I tell you, the LWF is one of the most transparent, you know, uh, NGOs in the world, you see. But what I want to tell you is very international aid, you know, must increase and must have different points of view. Sometimes I feel that the international aid is just limiting us, limiting churches, limiting people on the other side to do justice for what they are, what they are doing. And the churches should challenge the government that should, they should raise and make a new new regulations for the international that speaks about equality, justice, transparency, but also allowing people to, to, to be independent and interdependent at the same time. And that sometimes I miss. Yeah. 
Okay, I'm going to hand over to Sarah to field any questions there may be, and I'll come back um, in a few minutes. Thank you for that, Helen. So we have actually a few questions that have come through, but I'll start first with Tom Brooks' question, which is that the UK Home Secretary refers to illegal asylum seekers. Can it be illegal to seek asylum in international law? Now, I know neither of you are international lawyers, but I'm sure you might have thoughts on that statement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are two levels of this, isn't it? I mean, the biggest problem is that actually those, even those who have been accepted by the UNHCR as refugee seekers, asylum seekers, and have been accepted as such, even those people are not even being able to be distributed out to European countries. Even in Norway, I don't know how few we have accepted to have now, but it's only a very limited number, and it's after a, a special kind of scrutiny after. So, so there are no refugees being able to come. What is meant by illegal asylum seekers are those who um, have not gone through the UNHCR procedure and is at the border and want asylum. And they will sometimes be called illegal because they have come there. But according to the international law, they should have been accepted and the case should have been looked at at the place where they come. So therefore, Tom Brook is right. Uh, it cannot be uh, illegal to seek asylum according to international law. But in practice, it unfortunately is like that. And uh, the next question, I'd, I'd love to hear Bishop Neenib's response ab about the idea of um, how good intentions can sometimes have poor consequences. Mm. And our colleague, Anna Krauss, if she's able to unmute her, her microphone, it'd be great to have her deliver her question directly about using the example of the, the German church. Yes, um, thank you. Thank you both for your important um, statements and your loud voices in this debate. Um, my question is basically uh, about a debate we had in Germany, whether or not to send boats to rescue refugees and migrants in the Mediterranean Sea, mm -hmm. um, because the fear was that um, the church would directly play into the hands of people smugglers who would even, you know, who would use even more reckless methods of trying to transport people across the Mediterranean Sea, knowing that um, the refugees might be saved. Um, by these boats. Um, the church did in the end send a boat uh, sea, um, sea Rescue 4, I think it was called. So my question is really, is there, is there, um, is it a question uh, that we, you know, um, need to think about how we can avoid playing into the hands of people who really abuse refugees in, in that way? Well, thank you. I think this is a very important, yes, they are, there are uh, um, people who are uh, milking the refugees, you know, who are getting, you know, sometimes to get them into a boat, they have to pay $2,000, uh, you know, for, for each person. And sometimes they sell their houses or their gold or whatever they have, their property in order to be there. And it's not sure if they will be, they will be, they can cross safely or they will die on the way. I think this is, this, uh, I mean, the Interpol and the police and, and should really deal with those who are abusing the, the, the work of, with the refugees in, 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 in such a way. And we, and I think the police, they know them and they are. Now, um, what the churches, you know, I think, what the church in uh, Germany, the AKD has done and with Felt and others is very, really appreciative. I remember that Bishop Heinrich Bettstrom went to the, uh, to, to the railway station as was receiving them. And he was criticized by local politicians, you see. Um, and they told them the same thing that the good intentions are not good. Why are they busy coming to Germany? Germany tomorrow will become a Muslim, no more a Christian country. I think these are wrong. Uh, wrong understandings, uh, wrong understanding. I think it's our role as a church to help 
that there is no fraud and to combat those merchants of refugees who make the refugees as a merchandise and to stop them, but at the same time, to help them to cross in a safe way and to give them as much as possible, you know, aid that they can, that they can cross, not to stop them. And what the German churches have done, I really appreciate it. And I think, I hope you can continue it. I encourage it because I understand, you know, and, and, and I understand, you know, the dilemma which you are having, but at the same time, you know, um, when you have to do prophetic diaconia, you never count, the, uh, you never count the expense and the price. You just do it for the sake of Christ. And, and I think that's very important what you have done. Thank you. And Bishop Tor, did you want to add anything to that? No, I have uh, read about the initiative or the, the, the profile of the, the church in uh, Germany, as Anna mentioned here. And I've been so happy to see that. We have not dared to do that in, uh, in no way. Uh, there has been some support, but the church itself has not uh, taken an initiative like uh, you have done in Germany. So... Uh, having those kind of prophetic signs, uh, I think is very important because it is a question of each human being and we have to be accountable for how we are solving those in real trouble. There are people who misuse it and use it for other purposes, but we should not look at them as a big problem. The biggest problem are those who are really in need and we should help and we must not forget them forget them as a main kind of focus, I think, in the whole question of refugees. Bishop Thor, may I dare to speak something about Norway after your permission? <laughs> yes, I give you the permission uh, <laughs> the former, when the to former, say whatever you want. The former yeah. Bishop of Oslo, Bishop Gunnar Stolset, Gunnar Stolset yes. had challenged his government because of an illegal, you know, a refugee. I know, yes, I know. Well, and he went to court mm. and they 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 find him mm. with 10,000, you know, uh, Norwegian kroner because he had done it. But he challenged the government and I, wrote, I spoke with him and I appreciated his work. I think he has done the right thing and he has challenged the government that he obliged the government to change its policies with this. And that's yes. what we, the church can do. Yeah, yes, I'm working with him very much, with the yes. organization I mentioned, and, and she's a member of all, or our organization. I know. That. And the politi politicians, they have now made it a little bit, bit on the top here. So maybe 20 people will be able to stay, or those who have been over uh, 20 years in, in 16 years in Norway, being at uh, age of 65 or something. So they have made a very little hole in the in the uh, to make them accessible. But uh, Stolzet was the, the Bishop Stolzet was doing a very good job with that, and it got a lot of attention. Yeah. But the politicians are very slow on this because the unfortunate thing is that popular mood is not in uh, support of any. Mm. more positive attitude towards refugees and so on. So this is a big moral item where we have to speak clearly and challenge the churches. And I look forward to working more with the uh, LCIGB, the Lutheran Church in Great Britain, to challenge us. How can we be handling this? And uh, uh, also inside the council, the CLC, how can we be together with the rest of the churches in, in the UK to challenge the politicians to change the rules and open their minds and getting support for that also when it comes to voting for members of parliament and so on. Thank you for that. And uh, I, I think it's worth pointing out, it's the three of us on the screen at the moment are all Lutheran pastors and we've all professed mm -hmm. our love for the Lutheran World Federation and the great work it's done. Um, but I think it's always worth rem remembering, as you've just mentioned, Bishop Tor, that we still continue to have the need to challenge ourselves. Um, the work is not done, and the work needs to be done not unilaterally, 
but in cooperation with one another, seeing, seeing our humanity in one another is really, really what it's all about. Um, and going forward together, not with one group leading, but going forward together. And I appreciate uh, both of you contributing to that challenging to our church, to the Lutheran churches um, and to the communities in which you live and in which you are so active. I'm going to hand back to Helen now um, as we sadly have to tie up our conversation this evening. Well, I'd like to thank you and join you with um, actually our development director who's put a, a, a comment in the chat saying how grateful she is to you both, both for your time in this fantastic conversation today and your thoughts and reminding us on how we can join our, th our, our philosophies and ideas and humanity um, in a way that can make us welcoming to strangers um, and also especially for helping us to become um, a university college of sanctuary. Uh, in the meantime, I would just like to say thank you very much, you. Um, Bishop and Bishop Tor for your time this evening and for inspiring us um, in this important work. Thank Good you. night. Thank you for good night and thank good. you for your work. Thank yes. You. See you later.